Okay, guys, why don't we start with a word of prayer, and then we're going to continue our study on Survey of Revelation. Let us pray. Father, thank you, as always, for giving us the opportunity to come together on a Thursday night so that we can know you more through your word. And Father, if we have committed any sins, we name them to you in the privacy of our hearts, knowing full well that you'll forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I ask now, Father, that you would help us to concentrate on the information that we're going to look at tonight. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, we're pushing through chapter 3. And uh, remember, last week, this is where we left off. We are on verse 10. And let me just read the, the context of Revelation 3. Uh, if you have your Bibles, maybe just um, go back to, um, go to verse 10. And remember, he's talking to the church in Philadelphia. Remember that? So kind of let me just read it from uh, verse 7. It says, and, the, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write these things, says, He who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. And remember he said to the, this particular church, I know your works and see I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength and have kept my word and have not denied my name. So I had pointed out uh, the last several weeks that uh, just as he is combing through the various churches or addressing these churches, uh, he makes known that he knows of their works, he knows of their sin, he knows of the activities that they are going through. And so in so many ways we could be encouraged while at the same time convicted because he knows that he we know that he is observing us individually as well as collectively so he does know of their works as a church and verse 9 indeed i will make those of the synagogue of satan who say they are jews and are not but lie indeed i will make them come and worship before your feet not that they would he would they would worship them but um, of course christ and to know that i have loved you because you have kept my commandments, and that leads us to verse 10, church at Philadelphia, because you have kept my command to, what's the word? Persevere. Uh, persevere. Okay. persevere. And that's okay, but what does that actually mean? To continue in the word. To continue in the word or to continue in the work. So I, let, let's just kind of look at this again. I, you have kept my command to persevere. So is this optional? Why not? It's, a command. it's right there in the text, right? It's a command. So commands are not optional. Commands are those things that we are told to do. We have to honor this. We have to um, apply the principles or the command and this command here is to persevere. So this church was commanded to persevere, and we are also commanded to persevere. Now, why would we need to persevere? What, what does that imply if we are commanded, or the church is commanded to persevere? Our, our fellowship with God. Okay, our fellowship with God, good. What else? Why, why would the command be to persevere? Ah, very good. So when we look at keywords like that, we, we can basically tell that there's going to be some difficulty and challenges. I mean, otherwise, we, we wouldn't be told or commanded to persevere. So this church, just as our churches today, the churches today, are commanded to persevere. Not to prove that you're a real Christian, not to prove that you're saved, but because God said so. Now, if there is something there that says, if in order for you to prove something, you need to persevere, then we can, we can look at it that way, or we can interpret it or understand it that way. But the only thing that Revelation 3.10 says is that you have been commanded to persevere. So tough it out, remain steadfast. I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world, ultimately, during the tribulation, to test those who dwell on the earth. 
So the first thing I want us to zoom in on is the opening of verse 10. Uh, notice what it says, you have kept my command to persevere. And remember, we had talked about this last week. The Philadelphians or these Christians here, these believers had maintained God's truth by living it out before men. That's what the church is supposed to do. We're supposed to live out the principles or the truth of God's word before men. And men is just used in a general sense to mean everybody, right? This church was faithful to the word when they faced trials. So there are some churches today that cave into pressure. Remember? They cave into pressure. And what are some of the things that churches cave into? What would you say? The obvious, of course, is um, if there is a threatening situation, life-threatening situation, right? Um, but uh, what are some of the subtle ones? Can you think, can you think of anything where um, it would be a trial of some kind, and so instead of persevering, they give in? They try to give in to the feeling good. Very good. That's definitely a very big one today. I think... Uh, Raphael has mentioned that in the past too, right? People are more focused on their feelings than on truth. Now, the thing with feelings is that we're all, we all have feelings, right? I mean, we're all made up, we, we all, our, our makeup, part of our makeup is, includes feelings. But we should never be led by feelings, we should be led by God's truth, right? Because that's what keeps us safe not how we feel at the moment, because our feelings could be slanted, it could be blurred from truth, and so we don't have the, the, the full picture, and so we feel a certain way, we feel slighted, we feel like they're ignoring us, and we, it may not be true at all. So what we have to do is rather than react, we have to respond to truth. So another thing that I think is true with churches today is aside from just the feelings and being feeling oriented again nothing wrong with feelings but i think a lot of churches are into numbers keeping membership rather than quality of teaching quality of instruction so there's too many churches now that are trying to compete with each other as far as numbers and they base their success you know your your ministry is a success if you have x number of people in the membership you, you see this, um, I get, as a pastor, I get ads all the time, you know, breaking the thousand barrier, breaking the 500 barrier, the successful ministry. It's always linked to numbers, but successful ministry doesn't depend on numbers. I mean, there's a lot of world religions out there that have millions of followers or disciples, but that doesn't make them successful. They're still at odds with God. Mormons have millions of people. JWs have lots of membership, but that doesn't mean God is blessing them. So likewise, um, there are some churches that are more into the numbers and the membership rather than the quality of instruction. The, the flip side, the downside of quality instruction is that it takes perseverance. It takes dedication, it takes commitment, it takes a pencil or a pen and a notepad to write down the things that are important to note. And so there's a, there's a real studying taking place, but churches today are into, you know, let's move, okay? 15 minutes, give me a 15 minute sermon, and then I get to go home. I wanna feel good, give me, some, uh, give me a promise, I'll expound on the promise, and then I'm ready to go home. But the truth is, if you know, people who want to have stability and want to have peace of mind and want to have hope, the only way that they're going to get it is to, to be exposed to doctrine. They have to be exposed to God's word. And the majority of the times, it's going to take time. It's not something that you can rush through. I mean, I'd love for my son to be 15 years old now so we can do all kinds of things. But I can't rush that. I can't accelerate that. Um, there are certain things I can do as a father, of course, to expedite certain things as far as coordination and things like that. But as far as growth, that's going to be through a constant uh, regularity of the intake of food, ample rest and food and protection, you know, making sure he doesn't hurt himself. 
And likewise, it's the same thing for us as believers in Christ. We want to be mature. We want to be able to know right from wrong, but that's only going to come through a regular intake of God's word. Hebrews 5 is very clear. Romans 12, 2, and other verses talk about the importance of getting into the word. Nobody, I think when we take on, I, I think I was talking to Bill about this a week or so ago, as it's kind of like um, fitness. The craze today is fitness. People want to be fit. Are we going to do strength conditioning? Are we going to do cardio? Some people say, no, don't do cardio. Some people say, no, don't do strength fitnessing. No, all you have to do is walk. So, you know, everyone has their own say, but the important thing here is do something, right? move. And it's the same thing with the scripture. Some people say, I don't have an hour a day. I don't have five hours a day. I don't have 30 minutes a day. Well, if you start somewhere with three minutes, five minutes, then you'll gain. You'll start to pick up the momentum. All of a sudden, you're going to appreciate the things that you're going to discover as you're uh, spending time with God and his word. As I've said before, if you want to hear God, get into his word. If you want to hear God audibly, read it out loud. Because everything contained in scripture comes from God. And how many times do I hear people say, oh, I want to experience God. I want to see God. I, I want to feel God. Well, he left us his word and that should suffice. So the church was faithful to God's word even when they faced trial. And the reason why they were able to endure is because they persevered. They, they were obedient to the command to persevere. And likewise, we ought to persevere too. We get hit, we're gonna get hit from time to time, right? I mean, don't you get hit with trials? Don't you get hit with challenges? Sometimes it's internal within the church, sometimes in the home, uh, sometimes it's at work, sometimes it's from relatives. So whatever the case may be, the command to persevere is in place. That's non-negotiable. We have to persevere because we're representatives of him. We've been tagged with two titles, remember? We're all a royal priest, we're all an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Your ambassadorship depends heavily on your priesthood. If you're weak on your priesthood between you and God, meaning if you don't have sufficient quality time with God, that's gonna reflect on how you are as an ambassador. So people want to witness, people want to get busy for Christ, but if they're shallow or anemic in their personal relationship with God as a priest, where it's private, behind closed doors, between you and God, God and you, if that is not there, if that's not in place, that'll come out loud and clear as you are caring about, doing about your business as an ambassador. You're going to come out there, you're going to share, and you're just going to say, oh yeah, you need Jesus. What, what do I need? Why do I need Jesus? Well, because you just, uh, you do. And then all of a sudden you're going to realize that there's no substance behind what you're communicating because although you're busy and you're out there and you're telling people about Christ, the content is not where it's supposed to be. Remember what I've said before? It's kind of like a car salesman. When you first start off, you're probably going to be really lousy because there's a lot of things you have to pick up. You have to be very confident in what you do. You have to be, um, be able to go up to the person and say, hey, what would it take for you to drive this car home tonight, Raphael? You have to be extremely confident in the product. Otherwise, you, don't, you have no sale. But if, you, if you're going to be a car salesperson and you're going to say, someone's going to come up to you and say, do you work here? Um, yeah. Um, I, I'm interested in this car. What kind of financing can I get? Well, um, hmm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not really sure. You know, if you, if you have no answers for people who are seeking, you're not going to close the deal. But you have to be there and say, sir, you know what, that's a very good question. Let me ask you a question if you don't mind. Then I'll get to your finance, finance question. What would it take for you to drive this car home tonight? What would it take to surprise your wife? What would it take to surprise your husband? Because you would look good behind the steering wheel. You have family? You do? Oh, did you know that this is rated number two in the world as far as safety? How can you not purchase a car like this? 
Let me get my sales manager and let's see what kind of deal we can get for you. Oh, no, 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 I'm just here to shop around. Oh, yeah, I understand, but let, let's just see what he can do for you should you be interested. That kind of personality, that kind of confidence, you can sell Tupperware. And likewise, if you don't have the confidence in your relationship with God, that's going to be evident too. So that's why our ambassador title is going to be greatly influenced by what we do as a priest. Now, if you as a priest, on, on your free time at home, if your relationship is where it's supposed to be, boy, that's going to come out loud and clear when you start communicating with other people. They're going to know that you've, you've spent sufficient time with your Lord because the confidence that's going to come out, you know what, um, you're right, there are lots of religions out there. You're right, there are Mormons, there are JWs, there are all kinds of systems, and I don't doubt that at all. But one thing I'm sure is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I am sure of that without a shadow of a doubt. And not too, too many people can say that. These guys here, they persevered amidst the trial. And to me, that is very, very key. Because if the church did not um, continue to persevere, what would be affected? Well, that's right. It'll be spiritually dead. What else? If the church does not persevere in the midst of trials, what would happen? Church is dead, spiritually speaking. What else? He will, he will take them out. The, he'll remove the lampstand or the church. What else? Maybe the church will be closed. Church might close. There's no purpose for the church anymore, right? So if a church is constantly folding because of trials, then you have a, a, an anemic church. And so the people that could be impacted with the circle of people that you know, if you're a part of a dead church, you're not going to say anything because trials are hitting you. There hasn't been any instruction coming from behind the pulpit, coupled with personal time with God when you're at home. And so when you get hit with a trial, guess what happens? What typically happens to people when they're facing a trial? Do you see them on Sundays? Do you see them in Bible studies? No. Depends, right? Depends, depends. If they're mature, then it doesn't matter if they're going through trials because that's a fact of life. But if they're not grounded, they can't go. Why? They're emotional. I'm getting hit. I can't think. My head is spinning. So they can't persevere. So this church was able to persevere amidst the trials. This is a good church from this standpoint. We need more churches, churches that will stand and persevere amidst the trials, irregardless of what's going on, irregardless of the threats of ISIS, the threats of the crime and the shooting and the killing, the bombing. We have to persevere in the commands of God. Otherwise, what's our purpose here? You and I live here. You and I, by his grace, are allowed to live here and take up space because he, we represent him. But if we're not proactive in doing something, he might as well take us home. We, I mean, you're not here to just work. You're not here to just enjoy life. That's a part of the benefits of the salvation package in Christ. But that's with the understanding that you're going to persevere. Nobody is saying you can't have fun. We as believers should have the utmost fun. Because we know where we're going. Worst case scenario, take our last breath. Where are we going to be? We're going to be face to face with him. Can everybody say that? No. We know people who can't say that. So until such time, boom, we keep making impact. Plant that seed. Let someone else water it, and God ultimately will give the increase. But we need to persevere. Why? It's commanded. Commanded to persevere. Next one. I will keep you from the hour 
of trial. The hour of trial refers to a time of trouble that the entire Roman world would undergo in the reader's life. So I'm going to keep you from the hour of trial if you persevere. Persevere. So um, you'll see the word trials come up. What do you think of when you think of trials? Fear, hard times, okay. problems, right? Okay. Um, in this book, you're going to also, um, especially when you see the hour of trial, you'll, this is usually connected to the great tribulation. But the problem with that view is he's telling them to persevere. And if you persevere, then I'm going to keep you. I mean, if we look at it that way, I will keep you from the great tribulation if you persevere in my commands. So the problem there is, if you do this, then I won't let you go through the tribulation. The truth is, if you believe in the rapture, we're out. It's not dependent on persevering. The rapture depends on whether or not we're a child of God. And what does it take to become a child of God? Believing in Jesus Christ. So in this one, there's a special promise here. For this church at Philadelphia, I'll keep you from the hour of trial. And notice it's kind of faded right now. But just that's so that our eyes could see um, the verse in view, the, the line in view. The words in view, I will keep you from the hour of trial. So we'll look in just a moment what he's referring to here. He now, Jesus now turns to a promise for those who persevere under trial. This church will be guarded from the trial. So this particular church had a promise. I'm going to keep you from the trial the hour of trial because you persevered. Okay? Notice the next line. Sorry, yes? What is the reader's life? The which one? The reader's life. The, the time of the, the recipients. So the one, when they were reading it during that time, um, it's referring to the, the reader, the recipient of that letter. Oh. See, so the reader's life, the one who's reading it. So like when we read the scripture, we're reading, right? Whether we're at home or at church, the reader's life. So maybe I could reword that, but all I'm saying there is the, the time of uh, when the person was actually reading it, the recipients of the letter as written to Philadelphia. So I could probably clean that up next time around which shall come upon the whole world. The word shall come signify both intention and, signif and, and necessity and therefore the certainty of what is to take place. So this word, this is a word of purpose, certainty, compulsion, um, or necessity. Jesus is assuring the obedient believers in Philadelphia that they would have his protection during the time of turmoil sent to, the, to trouble those on earth. So he's going to protect them from this trial. They, we, see, we have examples in the Old Testament where God would send a calamity. Um, you remember, I'm, I'm sure you remember um, the ten plagues with Pharaoh. Remember that? There were ten plagues, and who sent it? God did. So apparently we don't have all the specifics, but he's going to send it to those who are there. Um, and notice what it says, to test those who dwell on the earth. See? So we know, we go back and we think of Mos uh, uh, Moses and Pharaoh and every time God, um, we, we looked at this, you remember Bill and Emily, 
Um, do you guys remember what was the, the cause of um, Pharaoh's hardening of the heart? There's one or two verses that talk about how God hardened Pharaoh's heart, but several times it was Pharaoh who hardened his heart. <clears throat> but do you remember what was the reason why Pharaoh got angry and decided to go back after his people? Because there was time, remember, you know, uh, okay, uh, just tell him to pull back the plague, take the frogs back. You know, remove the, the blood from the, the waters. Remember that? So when God would do that, then what would happen? You guys remember? What was the cause for Pharaoh to fight back? He takes it back and he says, you know what? I changed my mind. Go get him. Remember that? Several times he does that. It's interesting because when we looked at this several months ago, I noticed that what prompted Pharaoh to go after God's people was after God extended grace. It was after God extended grace and pulled back the calamity or the plague. That's when Pharaoh said, you know what? Go get him. To me, it'd be like, if he can do this, I'm not going to mess with this God. This God is powerful. But it's interesting that the hardening of the heart was the result of God's grace. God extended grace, and then shortly after that, you see Pharaoh change his mind. Go get him. So God, the Son, is going to send a trial, the hour of trial. They're going to be kept from the hour of trial. Why? They persevered. They were obedient to his command. They kept his command. But there is going to be this hour of trial, according to Revelation 3.10. To test those who dwell on the earth. There is a coming time of trial that shall come upon those at the exact moment Jesus sends it forth. We don't have too much details beyond this. So under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we are told that this is what the message was to the church at Philadelphia. Very personal I want you guys to know that I've, I've been observing you. I know your works. I know that you were persevering. I appreciate that amidst the trials. I appreciate that. And because of that, there's a special blessing for you guys. I'm going to spare you from the hour of trial. You're not going to endure, undergo what these guys are going to be going through, those here on the earth. So there is a coming of trial set. Um, that shall come upon those at the exact moment he sends it forth. Which now takes us to verse 11. Then he says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your... Crown. You mean someone can take your crown? You know how many crowns there are in the scripture? Seven. There are seven trials. I mean, um, not trials, seven crowns that we can earn. Seven, seven crowns. Notice what he says here. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may take your crown. So notice, I am coming quickly. The word quickly means swift and speedy. When he comes, the event will unfold rapidly. It will happen with one fell swoop. His coming will take place in a short time. It will be sudden and unexpected. So the coming of Christ is an incentive for perseverance under pressure. Wouldn't you say that that's so? 
the coming of Christ is an incentive to persevere? Um, sure, we're saved. What if we don't persevere? We're still saved. But notice what Jesus said to this church at Philadelphia. They were going to be spared from this particular calamity that was forthcoming. So the constant expectation of the imminent coming of Christ keeps us on the tiptoe of expectancy. Are any of you looking forward to the day of Christ? I think we all are, right? What does that mean to you? So, no more suffering. No more pain. It means that everything we go through is worth it in the end. Yeah. Everything we go through is worth it in the end. Very good. No more sickness. So that's referring to us. Do you have people who are not going to experience what you just said? You'd have to be a believer first to be able to say no more suffering, it's all worth it, no more pain. Again, the revelation is these are eschatological events, right? These are future events. These are things that are going to happen when we talk about the tribulation on. It should motivate us to be proactive in telling people. We're looking at what's going to happen in the future. When you, when you read Facebook or the news online, Google, um, whatever you use for news, by the time you read it, it's already past. It's not even current anymore. It's old news. It could be several hours. It could be a day. It could be something that's already gone. It's, it's in the past. We read news. We want to stay current. But the, the fact is, the truth is, it's not current anymore by the time we read it. It's already past. The scriptures are the, is the only book that tells us of future events before they occur, especially with what's contained in Revelation from four on. So what we're seeing now, and as we come to, when we wrap up Revelation 3, we're done as far as the church. The church is going to be gone, and chapters 4 on is going to be very, very interesting. So we're looking at what Jesus is saying to the, the churches, the various churches, the seven churches, and then after that, the rest of Revelation is going to be for those who rejected Christ. So here we are, we're saying, I can't wait. Can't wait to be with Christ. I, no more suffering, no more pain. We'll be together for all eternity. We'll be, we'll be with our Lord. Be a night. I'm sure that's going to be uh, well worth it, as Bill said. But we're going to leave people behind, I'm sure. So our responsibility is... Uh, until that time, is to communicate to our loved ones and friends. So it's going to be sudden and unexpected. Uh, kind of like, you know, a thief in the night. They, you don't know when a thief is going to strike, but when he strikes, it's usually too late to, to recover, to do anything. They're gone. Uh, when he comes, he's going to take what belongs to him, which is the church, and then we're gone. So we have nothing to worry about. But for our loved ones and friends, family, who don't know Christ the way that we do, boy, we're going to be like the rich, uh, the, the, rich um, the rich man, remember in Luke 16, where he said, you know, um, let um, Lazarus go and talk to my five brothers. I don't want them to come here. And Abraham said, no, they have Moses and the prophets. So again, it's pointing to the scripture. 
the Old Testament specifically during that time. I am coming quickly. Next line says, hold fast what you have. Christ calls the church to continue to persevere because the coming of Christ is imminent. You know what imminent means, anyone? Sure. Yeah, for sure and true. true guaranteed. Can, guaranteed, but anytime. Anytime. What are the signs before the rapture of the church? Are there any signs? There are no signs that must precede before the rapture of the church. Did you know that? The signs that we see um, in Timothy and other places where these are the signs of lovers of money and so on, that's in reference to the second coming. So when you see these things, you're living during the tribulation, which is going to be after chapter 3 of Revelation. When you start seeing these things, Jesus is going to return. But we're going to be gone. And when the second coming takes place, we come back with him. Why? We were raptured out. So there's a distinction, as you know, between the rapture and the second coming. The rapture takes place and there are no signs that have to take place. It could happen in 10 minutes from now. We don't, there isn't a shaking of hands with anybody, world leaders, nothing. The signs that we see in scripture are related to the second coming, not the rapture. So the rapture can take place any time. So the good news is, is that we could be free any second now. The bad news is, is that because we don't have any kind of clue when he's going to return, we have to be busy as if he's coming back in 10 minutes, 5 minutes. Because once we're gone, that's it. Good for us, but for the people that we know, um, they're going to be left behind. They're going to have to sift through the scripture. Hopefully you made a small impact. Uh, hey, you know, uh, Raphael's been inviting me to church all this time. Let me, let me read that track that he gave me. He gave me a track like two months ago. I'm so glad I didn't throw it. I'm, putting the, I'm connecting all the dots. Everyone that seems to be missing all around the world seem to be churchgoers. So let's see what they did. I think Raphael mentioned something about uh, John, the book of John or something. So they would have seven years to figure it out. Um, and if they don't figure it out, what will happen to them if they don't figure it out? Anyone know? Let's say we're left behind and we don't figure it out. We don't um, respond to Christ. What would happen to us during the seven-year tribulation? Do you know? We will suffer at the end, that's right, because of the 21 judgments. We could be killed. But we wouldn't go through the pressure that the believers would because we'll take the mark, we'll eat, we'll be able to shop, everything's going to be fine until God decides to hurl the 21 judgments here on earth, which is what we're going to read in the future. Emily? Yeah. And be part of the suffering. They will be here, and part of the suffering is hiding for their lives. Because be, they will be prosecuted. Yeah. It'll be against the laws of the land. You, you don't want to comply with the rules, the laws of the land, then your life is going to, you forfeit your life. They're going to look for you. And the, the key in scripture is uh, there's a, going to be beheading. And I've said before, it's, isn't it interesting how we're seeing a lot of that now? There's a lot of killing, a lot of beheading taking place. 10 years ago, 
you don't really hear much of that. But now it seems to be gaining. People are doing it more frequently. It's a norm now. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's a norm now. You see kids, you see women, you see men off with their heads. And in Revelation 9, I think, I think uh, it talks about how the uh, saints who suffered during the tribulation will be asking for revenge or when are you going to avenge us? They're in the altar. You know, their souls are crying out for avenge or revenge. And um, so it's already in scripture about what we're currently seeing now. People will be beheaded. So do you have friends that uh, are going to be left behind? You have family members? Let's do something about it. Now, if they don't respond to Christ, they don't have anything to worry about as far as from a human standpoint because they're in compliance with the laws of the land. But the moment the 21 judgments hits and impacts the world, they may lose their life then. And when they do, if they do, then they will spend eternity apart from God, the lake of fire. So that's why our job is a huge responsibility. What we are commanded to do as far as persevering and communicating as representatives of God is more important than anything else in this world. Your job, your responsibility and mine has more weight than any other responsibility or career path in the world. Because what we do and who we represent can influence someone's eternity. Doctors can only do so much, right? If it's time, it's, it's time. But if you're at the deathbed, if you're there, someone's dying, you arrive there 10 minutes before they pass, you have the opportunity to influence their future. Doctors can't do that. You communicate Jesus Christ, they respond to Jesus Christ, they're going to thank you, they're going to see you in the future. So that's why our responsibility is extremely important. We need to be proactive when it comes to sharing our faith. Well, this is where we will stop for now. We will pick this up next week on verse 11, and we will continue again with hold fast to what you have. Okay, so in the meantime... Think about these things. Think about what he said, Jesus said to the church at Philadelphia and how they were spared from a particular trial. Why? Because they were obedient to God's command to persevere. So persevering is a good thing. It's tough, it's difficult, it's challenging, but it's commanded. It's non-negotiable. It's something we must do. Father, thank you, as always, for giving us the opportunity to examine, again, a portion of your word so that we can grow and mature in our walk with you. Our job, of course, is to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior so that we would have um, information to communicate with those that we love, uh, those who are acquaintances or friends, Lord, those that, the people that we know. We know, Father, that uh, what we have in our possession, uh, as found in Scripture, has eternal consequences. If they respond to Jesus, then they receive everlasting life. If they continue to reject Jesus, then it's to their demise, and they will spend eternity apart from God, and ultimately in the lake of fire, as found in Revelation 20. Help us to be bold. Help us to be confident uh, when communicating truth. I know sometimes it could be a challenge, but Father, we are in possession already of everlasting life. We already have the kernel of truths that are needed to uh, watch a person pass from death into life. So we thank you, Father, for being recipients of your grace, being adopted into your family, uh, being chosen by you to be a royal priest as well as an ambassador to those all around us. We ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.